Space Marines might be portrayed as godlike beings, but genetic flaws are found in almost every single Space Marine gene seed regardless of their prime arc. While some are subtle, others are so apparent that they dramatically change a Battle Brothers life forever. The Blood Angels chapter is infamous for their genetic flaws, which have the potential to end a Space Marine's life if allowed to take hold. One of the biggest questions we get is what happens when the genetic flaw strikes a Battle Brother inside of a Dreadnought. This is a good question because a Space Marine inside of a Dreadnought is basically already on his deathbed. The chassis of the Dreadnought is a sarcophagus, so what does a genetic mutation do to an already dead Space Marine? The answer is that a space marine is kept alive by the life support systems of the dreadnought and the genetic flaw is allowed to run rampant on whatever is left inside of the sarcophagus. These types of situations are extremely rare and only a few of the dreadnoughts that succumb to a genetic flaw are allowed to live. The best example of these types of cursed battle brothers is the death company dreadnought. And with that said, I want to welcome you guys back to another 40 facts about the 40k universe. I am your host, Gersh1, and today we're going to be talking about the Dreadnoughts of the Death Company. If you guys are new to the channel, we post Warhammer 40k lore videos every single day. What I try to do with the 40 facts videos is create a lore portion in the beginning, a hobby portion in the middle, and then a Q&A where I answer the questions or the comments that you guys left off in the uh, previous 40 facts video. So if you guys have any suggestions, comments, uh, or questions, just ask in the comment section below. I'll answer them tomorrow. And if you guys like these types of lore videos, hit the thumbs up, let me know in the comment section below, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. But with all that said, let's get into 40 facts on the Death Company Dreadnoughts. Death Company Dreadnoughts differ from standard Imperial Dreadnoughts in that their occupants are Astartes that are suffering from the Blood Angel's genetic flaw known as the Black Rage. The Black Rage is a genetic flaw that creates mental instability in the Blood Angels, or one of their successor chapters. A battle brother is overcome with the memories and consciousness of Sanguinius. This intrusion mentally teleports the Astarte to the Siege of Terra that had occurred 10,000 Terran years ago. He is lost and unable to distinguish past from reality to the point where his fellow battle brothers might be perceived as the enemy. Some blood angels afflicted with the Black Rage may believe they are Sanguinius fighting in the bloody battles of the Horus Heresy, or they are the legionnaires desperately trying to save their Primarch from death. The Black Rage can strike a son of Sanguinius prior to or during a battle. When this happens, the uncontrollable rage of Sanguinius himself charges the Battle Brothers with constant anger, hatred, and fury. They possess a small portion of the Primarch's unearthly powers, as their strength and vitality boost to levels that seem superhuman even to those of the Space Marines. The condition is largely irreversible, and only a few Blood Angels have managed to overcome the flaw. Rather than let them face a slow, insane death, the Blood Angels and their successors will form a special unit from those that have newly succumbed to the Black Rage. This special force is known as the Death Company. The Dreadnoughts of the Blood Angels and their successors are not immune to the Black Rage, and a Dreadnought pilot that is consumed by the Black Rage can also join the ranks of their chapter's Death Company. A Dreadnought under the influence of the Black Rage is nearly impossible to control or restrain, and as such, he may rage out of control for solar days until the chapter's Tech Marines can rig a device to disable him. It is then up to the chapter sanguinary priest to judge whether or not the dreadnought's occupant should be sedated until the next battle or relieved of his life so that another can take its place. If the occupant of the dreadnought chassis is still sane enough to follow directions after he wakes up, he will be moved to the chapter's death company, where his dreadnought body will be able to withstand tremendous amounts of punishment and hopefully his unending rage will result in the death of many of the emperor's foes. Death Company Dreadnoughts are usually armed for close range combat, where their unstoppable rage and heavily armored sarcophagus render them nearly invulnerable to enemy attack. These Dreadnoughts are deployed by their chapter for assault purposes when enemy positions are deemed too dangerous for any Astarte except those who are under the influence of the Black Rage. As such, Death Company Dreadnoughts are almost always armed with two Dreadnought close combat weapons. These types of dreadnoughts are rarely ever armed with conventional long-range weaponry. It would be pointless, as these dreadnoughts would only use it until it is close enough to engage the enemy in melee. The chapter has learned to overcome this barrier by arming the dreadnought with two blood fists. This is a variant of the dreadnought power fist that is used exclusively by the blood angels and their successor chapters. These weapons are outfitted with an underslung storm bolter on one arm and an underslung melta gun on the other. Dreadnought Stormbolter can also be switched out for a Heavy Flamer for greater close combat firepower. Both of the Walker's Blood Fists can be replaced with a pair of Blood Talons. Just like the Blood Fist, the Blood Talons are used exclusively by the Blood Angels and their successors. They're just a variant of the Dreadnought Lightning Claw. The Blood Angels also have another weapon that is exclusive to the Death Company Dreadnoughts, the Mighty Magna Grapple. 
The magnet grapple is capable of firing several yards of tempered adamantium chain attached to a powerful magnetic and gravitic field generator. When fired at the enemy vehicle, the Magna Grapple's chains form an unyielding bond with the enemy vehicle's hull, allowing the Dreadnought to pull the vehicle in close to finish it off with its main close combat weapons. One of the Death Company's most famous Dreadnoughts was Moriar the Chosen. Moriar was once the captain of the Blood Angel's 4th Company, until he fell on the field of battle of Clamorga, defending a ridge against the Eldar. His mortal wounds proved too numerous and severe for even the skills of a sanguinary priest to heal up. As such, Moriar was placed within the adamantium sarcophagus of a mighty Furioso Dreadnought. It was built by Brother Merleo, which had contained the Blood Angel's heroes Balafon, Dario, and Amaretto before him. Upon awakening in this new, indestructible cybernetic body, Moriar was overcome by visions of Sanguinius's death during the Horus Heresy. Moriar's own near-death stage triggered the Curse of the Black Rage, an unusual occurrence in a Blood Angel Dreadnought. Immortal now in the adamantium shell, Moriar managed to survive the ravages of the Black Rage. He was then given the honor of continuing to serve his chapter by being placed within the chapter's infamous Death Company. As the sole dreadnought to serve within this company of dead men walking, Moriar now fights completely without fear, as befits warriors certain of their own demise and the furious willpower lent to them by the Black Rage. With his dreadnought body, he has been rendered impervious to wounds that would kill a regular battle brother. Some of the Blood Angel's greatest victories have followed in the wake of the furious assault led by Moriar the Chosen and his Death Company. Yet despite the glories of Moriar's valorous deeds, a price must be paid, for in the fleeting calm of victory, the mighty Dreadnought has sometimes also succumbed to the effects of the Red Thirst. To restrain him when not in battle, his revered battle brothers have modified his armor shell so that he may partake of the blood required to slake the awful curse. Now that we know the lore to the Death Company Dreadnought, it's time to paint one. Now this video is actually from our archives. It's an old video, so the sound's gonna be a little bit different and just, I'm gonna be a little bit more animated. I was more animated back then. Uh, but like I've told you guys in the past, this channel, we've created so many different types of 40K content. It's just that the lore stuff is the one that's stuck and the one that you guys know us about or for. Uh, but this video showcases how we were trying to do painting tutorials, gaming tutorials, all types of um, 40k content uh, so let's just watch I was gonna let you guys watch the original content but it's old and cringy so I don't want to make you guys uh, go through that instead I'm gonna do a quick little voiceover the first thing I did is I primed the entire model with a black this is your simple black spray paint that you get at the dollars or at the Walmart or, or any cheap place uh, it's matte don't get the gloss now I am dry brushing the entire thing with a gray. Use a crappy brush because remember that the dry, br dry brushing process actually ruins the bristles of your brush. And the purpose for this is to bring out the details as you guys can see. It's easier to paint uh, instead of painting on top of that like black primer. The first thing I'm going to do is uh, paint the silver bits. These are the ones that are supposed to be metallic, like hardcore metallic, like the wires that are connecting the side of the torso to the sarcophagus and the bottom portions of the sarcophagus. This is really up to you um, to decide uh, what needs to be hit with a metallic that is this strong. Remember that metallic really pulls the eyes because it's going to be lighter than the main color of this entire uh, dreadnought, which is black. Uh, and as you guys can see, I am painting each part separately. So make sure to, um, when you're painting like silver, make sure that the silver gets applied to every single one of the parts of the model. Otherwise you end up just um, spending a whole bunch of time. Uh, you're basically painting like four different uh, minis when it's really just one, or it could have been one if it was all pulled together. Now I, it's the details. Uh, so it's the red and the uh, gold, and now it's the brown on the skull and the banner. And this is probably going to require multiple coats, so make sure to uh, go over the red um, you know, once or twice if you need to, and thin out your paints if you can. Um, now it's time to... Oh, and then I'm just going to show you guys just that I am doing this process on the entire... Uh, or on every single model, because again, uh, it saves time if you actually paint everything all at once. And also the purpose of painting these things separately is so that you, you can get the details. Uh, now I did some edge highlighting with white. I was very, very sloppy. This is a process that I don't really do anymore that much uh, because it's too time consuming because now I had to paint it black and getting those details of the black 
uh, or getting that line so that it's black, white, and red is very, very difficult. Uh, it's a cool looking uh, model, but edge highlighting, I think, sometimes is a little overrated. Uh, a simple dry brush would do the job. Um, but there you have it. And also I picked out the details of like the skull, the wings of the uh, sarcophagus with white. And then I did the same thing with the actual arms. Uh, but the arms have been, I have been painting the arms with the same process. You just got, you guys haven't seen it on the actual um, camera. Um, but now it's time to paint the uh, talons, the blood talons, I think they're called. Uh, to do this, I'm going to uh, paint the entire thing a solid blue. And then after the solid blue has dried, I'm going to use a lighter blue and kind of paint small little lines that are supposed to depict lightning. Um, and then once that's done, I'm going to be using a white to uh, edge highlight the claws. Uh, edge highlighting the claws just gives it um, that like cartoony, cool looking uh, effect. Um, but it's not done. Uh, and after this, I have to paint the tips with uh, the actual white that I use for the highlight. And that is the finished um, blood talons. And there you have it. This is the finished model. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. I hope you guys enjoyed that little blast from the past. Um, now it's time to answer some questions that you guys left off in the last 40 facts video, the 40 facts and lore on the world eaters first battle with Angron. Um, I haven't been able to post 40 facts videos in a while. So I think this, this happened during the weekend. Um, but uh, let's see. The first question comes from Jonathan Thorpes. You've done videos about summoning corn or Nurgle into real space. Um, when are you going to finish with the other Chaos Gods? Uh, very soon, hopefully. Um, I have some things coming up like in my personal life that I'm probably not going to be able to write scripts that are good or that I want to put out um, probably until late July. Uh, so hopefully around late July. Um, it's... Uh, it's challenging, I guess, because I have ideas and then I have like I, I, I write them down and stuff like that. But like to actually sit down and create them, uh, it's way more uh, challenging, especially when you're trying to balance everything else. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm definitely going to go back to um, probably Slanesh will be the next one just because it seems like um, it's the one that gives me the most um, ideas and stuff like that. Um, but yes, it's coming. Uh, next question comes from Skull Kirillil. <laughs> With all the wax the Imperium uses to purify it for the purity seals, do you think they have entire Agri worlds dedicated to keep to to keep to to be keeping? Um, yes. Um, as I stumble through my words, yes, of course. Um, Imperial Agri worlds are crazy. Uh, like you can think of like so. I have read that it, some Agri worlds are built solely to create the food for another beast that has grown in another agri world um, so it's like it's growing like these little krills to feed to the groks and the groks are in a completely different planet so that's how expansive the imperium is where you have a planet to provide the food for the food that you will eat um, so yeah a giant um, or an entire planet dedicated to beehives um, yeah sure that can happen is that where wax comes from uh, bees I don't know um, this next comment comes from Alberto Ruano bro what is that you got in the background a coffee maker uh, no so th well, you can't really see it let's see this right here is not a coffee maker. It's um, the Da Vinci Mini something. It's a 3D printer. Um, I've I was thinking of 3D printing like different um, terrain pieces and then um, creating some type of like um, giveaway and stuff like that. But the printer is not that great. So I used it a couple times, didn't get the result that I wanted, and then I put it aside. Uh, and then now it's just collecting dust. Um, I'll probably get to it someday, but like I said earlier, um, it's just life. Life catches up, and then you can't really do what the projects that you're trying to do. Um, but yeah. Next question comes from Josh Ramos. I've been a fan for a while. Good stuff, guys. Thank you. 
uh, some mispronunciations here and there. I can barely speak uh, and there, uh, but I still appreciate the work you guys put in. Keep it up. Thanks, man. That was um, really nice. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to mispronounce things all the time, and the way that I speak is kind of off. Uh, English was not my first language. Um, just a little tidbit right there. Uh, next question comes from Alex Dar. You mentioned the Emperor and the Webway Project. Why does it have to be the Emperor who completed the Webway Project? What about others? Why doesn't anyone else uh, in the leadership seem to care if not compete? Is there something he particularly has or can do that would allow him to complete the webway? You have to remember that the webway portals are operated through Wraithbone. Wraithbone is a material that is that is psychically imprinted by the by the Eldar, and the Eldar, their ability to craft this uh, Wraithbone, um, compared to like. So their psychic abilities compared to a regular human is just, they, they're they completely different. Even like a good, strong Primaris, um, a Primaris, uh, what do you call it, Psyker, uh, which is different than like just the regular Space Marine Primarises. Um, but a Primaris Psyker is still not as strong as like a, a Seer, I think they're called seers um, the ones that create the wraith bone structure so yes the emperor has that innate psychic ability he is the most powerful psyker or the most powerful human psyker that has ever existed so he has that power to create that webway uh the problem number two is that it was a secret during the Horus Heresy or during the Great Crusade. Uh, so imagine like you coming into work and then your buddy comes up to you and was like, hey, I was working on this project. Um, only I was able to work on it. Uh, you finish it. Uh, obviously, there is nobody to pick up after what he left off. Um, that's not to say that they haven't tried. Another uh, element of why nobody has tried to complete the Webway project is because it's it's... Um, it blew up in the Emperor's face because of Magnus, even though Magnus did nothing wrong. Um, so to open up, to accidentally open up another warp portal inside or on Terra would be devastating. Um, so the people that have tried to pick up that project have been stopped because it's like, no, the Emperor was the only one that could do it. Leave it alone. Um, maybe if Belisarius call, uh, ever tries to like give 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 it a whack or whatever um then maybe uh, he might be able to try um but i think he's more interested in the pariah nexus and what the necrons are doing with the whole uh, great rift um but yeah a lot of reasons why the webway project was never really um, um completed and stuff like that next question comes from mask why do space marines not wear helmets what's that seems like a huge weakness to their defense um yeah, but I, I think at the end of the day, it's, um, I mean, they do it because GW wants to, to show off faces and stuff like that, but, like, also, kind of like in the movie 300, when, um, what's his name, the main dude, Leonidas, takes off his helmet so that he could see better, um, the helmet itself has a bunch of augers and things to make things um, easier to shoot and, and easier to, like, see, uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's a, um, it's a superhuman uh, who might not even need the helmet, so he takes it off. Uh, but that is a little bending the 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 like the suspension of reality in order to have a really cool looking mini without a helmet, if that makes sense. The next question comes from Noah Tinker. Did any of the Primarchs ever have any romantic relationships slash interest either before or after being found by the Emperor? Would any of them actually make a good partner? I don't think so. If anybody or if any of them, it would probably be uh, Fulgrim. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think that they really cared too much for um, doing anything like that. Next question comes from Papa Drew. Is there any loyalist world eaters fighting in defense of Terra? Uh, there's rumors like the Carcharodons were rumored to be one, but I think they already mentioned what the uh, successor chapter of the Carcharodons are now. Um, but ultimately, you should check out, like, if you're trying to create a homebrew chapter with the with the gene seed of the world eaters, you could. You should check out my 40 facts on a homebrew chapter. I'll put a link up above. If not, just look up uh, homebrewing Space Marine chapters and then One Mind Syndicate. Um, but it takes you through the steps on how that process could have happened and stuff. So, yeah. And then the next question comes from Joe Davidson. Do you think the 
odd successor chapters of the Ultramarines are actually the same members of the Lost Legion since they were in integrated after the fall of the Lost Primarchs. Yeah, there's there's rumors that that could be it. What you could do, again, going back to the whole homebrew um, idea, is if you're homebrewing your own successor chapter and you want them to be a successor chapter of the Lost Legion, that is an avenue for you to take and say, like, yes. Um, they were they were in the second founding, and they said that they were, came from the Ultramarines, but in reality, they came from one of the Lost Legion Legions. And then you have the ability to now create your own lore for the um, for that Primarch as well. Uh, make him a female uh, Primarch, and then make all your Space Marines female Space Marines, just to piss off everybody online. It's always fun. Next question comes from Nick Happy. Do a 40 facts and lore on the fruit fly. Yes, the fruit flies are gone. I actually bought a um, one of those carnivorous plants, and um, it attracts the bugs, and they go inside, and then they get stuck in a little sack. It looks like um, that one Pokemon... Victory Bell, I think it's called. Something like that. Uh, but yeah, so um, it solved that problem. Um, I might be able to do a 40 facts video on my fruit fly if it comes back. But then that means I have to eat in this room and it probably won't. Um, but yeah. And then uh, I'm trying to get to as many questions as I can as quickly as I can. Because um, I also don't want to keep you guys waiting so much. So this next question comes from Joe Davidson. Do you think it's possible that the Grey Knights are actually created from the Lost Legion instead of the Emperor? Yeah, that's a possibility. Um, just because, like, the Lost... Like, the, the whole point of the um, Lost Primarchs, um, or the Forgotten Primarchs, is that you can put in whatever you want. Um, having another psychically powerful Primarch would kind of make sense, or even two more psychically powerful Primarchs would make sense. Because out of all of them, they, like, all the Primarchs have some type of psychic ability, but Magnus was the only one that was truthfully, like, uh, like he was the main psychic Primarch. Uh, so having an additional one that then gave birth to the Great Knights could, could happen, um... Even though it is a lot of lore twisting, because I do think that um, the Grey Knights, they do just say that it's from the Emperor. Um, so, so yeah. And then um, uh, Nikolai Shaw says, I was looking at a different tab, but holy shit, nice camera. Loving the background, too. Thank you. This is actually a T3i. So it's a really, really old camera. I bought it back when I used to work at Best Buy. Um, good old Best Buy days. Uh, working retail sucked, though. Um, and, uh, thanks for, for loving the background. This is a graffiti artist from, um, Chicago. His name is Exhaust. I don't know if he still paints anymore. Um, but yeah, that's, this is his, um, piece. Um, and it was done back in like 2009. It's been, I've been carrying it, uh, around since then. Uh, but yeah, those were the questions for today. If you guys have more questions for me or any comments for you guys or that you guys would like me to react to tomorrow, uh, just comment down in the comment section below. Thank you guys so much for listening, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. This is Gershwin with One Mind Syndicate signing out. <laughs>